When We Two Parted is a poem about the end of an affair that Lord Byron, who was a notorious womaniser, had with Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster in 1813. In it, the speaker clearly feels that he has been badly treated by her as he laments the end of the relationship and describes his feelings of sorrow and despair at her lack of fidelity, which is ironic really as she was being unfaithful to her own husband at the time. He complains that he has had to suffer in silence because of the secrecy and that the pain he feels will endure for many years to come. I shall therefore use the words poet and speaker interchangeably in this video, as it is clear from biographical knowledge that they are one and the same. The circumstances of the breakup are ambiguous. Biographical information, such as the fact that Byron maintained that the affair was brief and ended before it became physical, and a missing fifth stanza, which he added years later in a letter to his cousin Lady Hardy, give some indication of what happened. The poem was written in about 1815, although Byron dated it 1808 in order to protect her identity further. It is believed he was inspired to write the poem some two years after the end of the affair on the discovery of another alleged liaison, this time between Lady Frances and the Duke of Wellington, who, famous for his victory at the Battle of Waterloo, was also infamous for his affairs. Although there is nothing in the poem as it stands to point the finger at Lady Frances, the missing fifth stanza identifies her by name. The poem has the feel of an internal monologue because the speaker is unable to talk about the affair in public and must remain silent. It is written using the first person I and we, and the second person, you, when the speaker directly addresses the lady who is the subject of the poem, using the archaic words thou and thee. It is what he would say to her face if he could. Indirectly, she may well have read it and realised that it was addressed to her, which may have been the whole point of the poem in the first place. The poem comprises four eight-line stanzas, or octets, with a simple rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, although there is a mixture of single rhyme, e.g. years and tears, and double rhyme, e.g. parted and hearted. It is written in accentual verse, which has a fixed number of stresses per line, regardless of the total number of syllables each one has. Byron has chosen two stressed syllables per line, resulting in very short lines of between four and six syllables. This makes the poem quite choppy and disjointed, perhaps as a means of conveying his highly disturbed emotional state. This type of rhythm may have rules on how many stressed syllables there are, but none on where they must fall. For example, iambic pentameter dictates that there are five pairs of syllables per line, of which the second syllable has to be stressed, e.g. didum. Accentual verse, on the other hand, tends to follow natural speech patterns and perhaps enhances the idea that this poem is an outpouring from the heart, rather than appearing as an overly crafted piece of work. In order to get an idea of how the rhythm sounds as a whole when read aloud, it is easier to look at pairs of lines rather than just one. If we do that, we can see that the bass metre is therefore largely, but not exclusively, dactylic, dum diddy, which due to the falling nature of the rhythm, where a stressed syllable is followed by two unstressed syllables, makes it ponderous and heavy, yet relentless at the same time. The poem starts with its main idea unfolding over its first six lines. When we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years, pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss. The end of their relationship has brought him sorrow and heartbreak, of which he is unable to publicly speak, whilst she, 
on the other hand, has reacted, as far as he is concerned, without emotion. He describes the pair of them as half broken hearted. Enhanced by the alliteration and assonance of the R sounds which fall on the line's two stressed syllables, this implies that only one of the two of them is suffering. Him. Byron's use of the verb sever to mean separate in this context is interesting. It is a very harsh word that implies cutting and slicing suddenly and forcibly, presumably to evoke the abruptness and painfulness of the moment. The imagery that the poet uses in lines five and six, pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss, alludes to the fact that she has been the one to end the relationship. She no longer has warm feelings for him, and her lack of responsiveness to him is as though she is now a corpse. The stanza ends with his belief that the way he felt at the moment of parting foretold the way he feels now, at this hour. The imagery relating to the cold and ill omens is repeated at the beginning of the second stanza. The pathetic fallacy in the lines, the dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow, evokes a cold, damp, early morning scene as the affair comes to an end. The verb sunk, with its connotations of heaviness, imply that he feels weighed down by his heartbreak. The lines, it felt like the warning of what I feel now, suggests that the way he feels now, i.e. feverish sleepless nights perhaps, where he has broken out in a cold sweat, was foreshadowed by how the morning dew on his skin felt then. It is not quite clear which vows he is referring to as being all broken in this line. Does he mean her marriage vows because she had entered into a clandestine relationship not only with him, but also with the Duke of Wellington? Or does he mean that the vows of love that she made to him are broken because of this second affair. Whichever vows he is referring to, it is clear with the line, and light is thy fame, that her reputation is now in tatters. The adjective light suggests that her reputation is no longer to be taken seriously and is the subject of mocking and prurient conversation. When he hears her name spoken, he shares in its shame. So when he hears her being gossiped about in this manner, he feels that he too must have a part in her dishonour. Note the sibilant alliteration on the two stressed syllables to highlight these feelings of secret disgrace. Once more, Byron carries over an idea from the end of the previous stanza to the beginning of the next. This time it is her name that he repeatedly has to hear as her scandalous behaviour becomes the topic of conversation. The repetition of they in lines 17 and 21 enhances the idea of Byron's solitude. He is part of a gathering of people and yet he is alone. The vagueness of the personal pronoun, who are they exactly? reveals that her disgrace is common knowledge. Whenever her name is mentioned in front of him, he hears instead a knell or the solemn tolling of a bell announcing a death or a funeral. Where once, presumably, her name would have evoked feelings of joy and excitement in him, this metaphor communicates how now it just reminds him of the death of their relationship and perhaps the death of any kind of enjoyment he will get from socialising with other people when she is what they talk about. A shudder comes o'er me. Even her name provokes a physical reaction in him, which could be interpreted as disgust, as he asks a rhetorical question, Why wert thou so dear? It is almost as though he cannot quite believe that he ever felt so strongly about her. The next lines, using anadiplosis to evoke the complicated situation in which he finds himself, describe how the people talking about her in his presence are completely oblivious to the fact that he knew her at all, 
let alone that he knew her too well, or, in this context, inappropriately. The stanza ends with his plaintive declaration that words cannot do justice to the length of time that he will bitterly regret their liaison. The use of anastrophe, or inversion of the natural word order, and the repetition of the word long emphasises this sentiment. This stanza also extensively uses assonance of long E sounds to enhance the feeling of heaviness and despair that he feels. The idea of secrecy follows on from the end of the previous stanza to the beginning of the next. In secret we met, in silence I grieve. The use of anaphora, where a word or words are repeated at the beginning of subsequent clauses, and the sibilance of secret and silence, enhance the confidential nature of the affair, and that he must suffer her faithlessness and deceit alone. They clearly have not seen each other since the split, because he uses the conditional mood, indicating a hypothetical scenario. Using a rhetorical question, he imagines how he would act and what he would say to her if he saw her again, even after many years had passed. If I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee? His answer is short, sharp and to the point, with silence and tears. Does he want her to feel sorry for him, or does he want to give her a taste of the pain he has felt through his lack of communication with her? Whichever it is, the poem comes full circle as any potential reunion will be marked in the same way as their separation. The fifth stanza, which Byron wrote in a letter to his cousin some eight years after the end of the affair, six years after his discovery of her affair with Wellington, but perhaps what is most significant, in the same year that Lady Frances's marriage actually broke down, makes for a convenient postscript. It gives further insight into how Byron did in fact feel after long years. No longer devastated by loss and longing, he is instead full of condemnation for her faithlessness, revealing his own brazen double standards as a bonus, asserting that she was now a fallen woman whom he wouldn't take back, even if he wanted to. The poem actually works better without the fifth stanza though, because its circular structure remains intact. The ideas at the end of each stanza are picked up at the beginning of the next, i.e. cold and ill omens between stanzas one and two, her name and his shame between stanzas two and three, secrecy and grief between stanzas three and four, and silence and tears between stanzas four and one. Thanks for watching. I'd really appreciate any questions or comments below. I look forward to hearing from you.